Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Young Patriots podcast. My name is Shannon Miles, and I know I haven't been uploading in a while, but this is my honor to introduce Pastor Rod Parker of the church I go to. And now just a little bit of backstory before I bring him on. He has been our pastor since the Remnant Revolution tour started whenever we met. And he's just the greatest guy. He's going to share his testimony, and I really hope you enjoy. So, Pastor Rod, welcome on to the show. Awesome. So good to be here with you, Shannon. It's great to have you on. It's my honor to have you on, in fact. So, could you tell our audience about your testimony and what all you've gone through and what led you to Jesus? Well, that's a mouthful, so we'll uh, we'll we'll cover it. But uh, again, it is an honor uh, for me to be here on your show. Uh, really, have a lot of respect for what you're doing in your ministry, and uh, I have a lot of uh, love and respect for this generation. It's such a that's one of the reasons why I'm out telling my story and really gone into full time ministry is to go out and and cast a net for your generation and uh, for the church as a whole. So uh, I haven't always been a pastor. Uh, I'm thankful that I'm a pastor now. Uh, but I've pastored, just to kind of give you a little bit of a history, I've pastored on several different levels. So my, uh, my family actually moved to Texas over 40 years ago to start a church called Covenant Church. And it ended up being a, a large church. It started in the front room of my parents' home with about five family members, and it grew to over 30,000 members. And so over the years, I've been able to be a part of small of, of small church plants because uh, we planted several other covenant churches in the metroplex and around the nation uh done a lot of work overseas and missions uh was uh kind of worked my way up through covenant church uh, i've always loved worship my family was big time into worship we had a a, a group called the singing parkers uh, that traveled the nation around when i was a kid and uh and so we love worship uh First and foremost, yes, I'm a pastor, and I love the Word. I love to preach. I love to do all that. But first and foremost, I'm a singer. I'm a worshiper. Me and my wife, uh, we help lead worship there at the church, as you know. But um, so everything that comes out of what we do at Jesus Encounters really comes uh, out of worship because the Bible says that he inhabits the praises of his people, not necessarily a great sermon or a rock star preacher or a great book or a great song. He says he inhabits the praises of his people. So we just put a huge emphasis on worship and praise there under the tent. And then the glory falls. Sometimes we worship for 45 minutes. Sometimes we'll worship for an hour and 45 minutes and the glory will fall. Holy spirit falls and he has his way. And so, uh, so that's really my first love is music. And with, with music being my first love in high school, you probably guys have probably heard of him. It is is uh, I grew up in Newman Smith. I went to went to I grew up in Carrollton, Texas. Went to Newman Smith High School in Carrollton, and one of my really good friends was Robbie Van Winkle, which is AKA Vanilla Ice. Uh, so that song "Ice Ice Baby" um, was written in uh, in my in my era. It was actually written part of that song was written in the front room of my apartment uh, in Carrollton, Texas, while we were partying and acting crazy and. And kind of doing our thing. So uh, I used to make up rhymes. I used to make up dance moves, and uh, and do all that. So I was actually uh, a part of that song, and part of it actually uh, getting on the on the radio. And uh, it was a whirlwind. Uh, as soon as it went on the radio, within four weeks, I think four or six weeks, we were top ten, and then uh, went on the road uh, with uh, Vanilla Ice for a while. We were opening for for uh, MC Hammer. And uh, when our song went number one, we were actually open for MC Hammer, the Can't Touch This tour. And uh, we were traveling with him, opening up for him. And then uh, we were actually on the Arsenio Hall show the day that our song went number one. And uh, and so we we uh, we thought that they should open for us and then not have to open for us, us not have to open for them. So it was a big thing on on the media back in that day. And uh, both both teams went to jail. Uh, a bunch of us backstage got into it with their backstage people, and it was a big fiasco. So a bunch of people went to jail except for Vanilla Ice and except for uh, 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 MC Hammer. Everybody else went to jail that day. But anyways, kind of my, my part of it was uh, writing part of that song, uh, and I was Dr. Feelgood. I was really kind of the part guy. Uh, 
uh, that was really kind of my role in all that. As I, I'm not proud of it. That was a part of my life that that I really have just even really been feeling released to talk more about in the last couple of years, Shannon, uh, because it was really some, it was a dark part of my life that I really don't like to give a lot of glory to. Uh, but it is part of my story, and uh, you know the Bible says that we overcome through the blood of the Lamb and the words of our testimony. And uh, it's the word of our testimony that helps us overcome. And so if God will, if God will pull me out of, uh, out of a world of, of, of that type of world, of the dark side, of sex, drugs, rock and roll, and everything that comes along with it, uh, if he'll do it for me, then he'll do it for you. He'll do it for anybody. And uh, during that time, um, I was, like I said, I was kind of like the, the party. I, I provided all the party favors. I, partied, I provided all the, all the drugs, all the girls, all the party. Uh, the place to have the party, uh, the whole thing, that really kind of was my role. That's what I was good at. And uh, like I said, I went on the road with him for a while. When things didn't really work out after we all kind of went to jail that night, uh, things weren't really working out on the royalties or any of that kind of thing. I got uh, I got mad and left the tour and went out on my own and came back to Texas and basically started uh, dealing drugs on a larger level because at that time now, I had already met a lot of celebrities. A lot of my clients that were coming to our parties, you know, and things like that were ex baseball players, ex Dallas Mavericks, uh, even current Dallas Maverick football, uh, basketball players and some Dallas Cowboy football players. I could name their names. Uh, I don't want to do that, but uh, I can name their names. Those are people that were, would come to our parties and ended up being really good friends of mine. And so that was ended up being my clientele. So, when I got when I got off the road, I had immediate clientele for parties, and so uh, I was kind of known as being uh, having some of the best coke in Dallas, which I'm not pr- proud of, uh, but that's that's the that's that's the truth. And uh, I got stabbed through the heart and lung on a drug deal that went bad in 1992. Uh, I believe it was 19 it was like July of 1992. Um, was uh, out partying one night and. Uh, and uh, some people came to actually rob my apartment. Uh, they knew I had a lot of cash and drugs and stuff in the house. And uh, a, yeah, a gang, a rival, a rival drug dealing gang that was in the area. I was in a bad part of town, which uh, was over by Parkland Hospital, which is in downtown Dallas area. Parkland Hospital is actually where they took uh, President John F. Kennedy when he was assassinated. Uh, I was stabbed through the heart and lung, like I said, with a drug deal that went bad. That was only a few blocks away from Parkland Hospital. And uh, so uh, these guys, uh, the short story was these guys opened the door to my house. I was actually standing in my bedroom and looked at the front door, saw them, there were six of them that tried to come in and rob me that night. I was counting money on my bed and I looked down the hallway and I could see them coming through the front door. When they saw me, they were surprised. I don't think they were really expecting to find anybody there. They took off running. And a deal like that, you don't call 911. It's not a situation where you hang up the phone and call 911. Yeah. <laughs> me, me and my brother were standing there. Drugs. Yeah, yeah, we had all kinds of drugs and uh, all kinds of stuff we shouldn't have had in that house. We certainly wasn't going to call the law. <laughs> but uh, so we took the law in our own hands that night, and we shouldn't. Have. That was a bad. That was a. That was a. The first bad choice of many that night that I made. Um, I was whiskey drunk. Uh, there's a song that's called says whiskey bent and hell bound. That's kind of what I was, uh, that night I had been drinking whiskey and just won an arm wrestling contest. And it was about two o'clock in the morning. And, uh, and so the adrenaline was flowing in my body. I'd had Coke in my system. I was all ramped up. We chased them out of my apartment. We saw that they were in the same apartment complex, but in a different building. And we actually found what room, what, what apartment it was. And the, the fight was on. All I can tell you is there was a lot of them and there was only two of us and a bunch of people went to the hospital that night. Uh, and I thought that we had uh, cleaned house on all of them and I was exiting and I was going through the parking lot back to my apartment. You could either go through the parking lot or you could go through the pool area. And I heard uh, my brother went through the pool area and, uh, we were celebrating because we thought we had cleaned house on all of them in that apartment. And I was coming up the parking lot into my apartment and I heard footsteps up behind me. I turned around, and when I did, I thought I was punched in the chest, but I was actually stabbed in the chest. And it stabbed me through the heart and lung. It ripped the fat sack around my heart, punctured a hole in my lung. Um, I ended up getting upstairs, didn't even know I was stabbed. I thought I was punched. 
because when he punched me, he turned off and, and ran. And so, uh, I didn't even, again, with the adrenaline, I didn't even know that I was stabbed at that time. I went upstairs and I could tell that I was out of breath. I could not hardly breathe getting upstairs. And I was wearing a white satin shirt. And my brother, whenever I walked in, he saw a big blood, uh, a, a big blood spot on my shirt. He ripped it open. He could see that I'd been stabbed. He said, man, you've been stabbed. He could hear the sucking sound coming through my lung. And uh, so I hit my knees at that point. I was pretty much out of air. They called 911. It didn't take them but just a few minutes for 911 to actually get there. Uh, they put me on a gurney. Uh, the last thing I remember, Shannon, was uh, the, the, the legs of the gurney hitting me behind my back as they were putting me into the ambulance. And they gassed it uh, in the ambulance. And I remember looking up, seeing the bottles shaking in the ambulance, and everything went black. And from that point on, uh, uh, I woke up with having an out-of-body experience. I talk about about an out-of-body experience, but uh, I used to be in the construction industry, and I ended up, and then when I woke back up, I was actually hanging out at the ceiling tiles, overlooking myself, being worked on, and they were prepping me for surgery. And I saw my dad run through the emergency room, and I saw him praying in his prayer language, and he was praying in, a, in his English language, and he was also praying in his prayer language. And I came to just briefly to tell him by and that I was dying. That's what I saw in my, in my out-of-body experience. And he said, no, son, you will live, you won't die. And he began to continue to pray in his prayer language. And, uh, and then me and Jesus had not a face-to-face. -face. I'm not going to sit here and say that I, I saw his face, but I will tell you that I had an experience with, with Jesus himself. I had a conversation with him and basically he gave me an ultimatum. He said, he let me look like a slideshow of my life and basically said, Rod, you can continue to live like hell and you'll burn in hell for eternity. That's one choice. Or you can run to me harder than you ever ran from me and tell everybody your story and uh, what I brought you through and you can live. Well, obviously I'm here and I woke up 11 days later in ICU with a trach down my throat and hoses out on the side of my, my side and God spared my life. And I've been running to him harder than I ever ran from him, to be honest with you. I wish I could sit here and say that it's always been um, uh, mountaintop experiences, uh, that I never made any other mistakes, but but I did. You know, I, when, I, when he spared my life, Shannon, I quickly uh, got amnesia and forgot the promise that I made to him whenever I said, oh, yes, God, I'll, I'll run to you harder than I ever ran from you. I woke up, and when I woke up in that hospital room, uh, I was from, like I told you, a larger church. At that time, it had, it had grown now to a pretty good-sized church where they we had influence all around the nation and all around the world. So he had my uncle and my family had people praying for me 24 hours a day, uh, not just in the United States, but around the nation and around the world. And uh, I came to and so I was really a truly a miracle that I woke up after 11 days at ICU. And... Uh, and within 24 hours, they had me up walking. And so with that being said, I already thought that I was 10 foot tall and bulletproof. And so uh, I thought, okay, yeah, I'm up. I'm a bad man. I overcame uh, I overcame the stab wound. I overcame I'm 24 dead. hours. Yeah, and 24 hours later, I'm walking. And so I wanted revenge. I wanted revenge big time. Uh, I, had, I got very racial. I was stabbed by a black gentleman. A, ba a black guy that was part of a gang. And, uh, and at that time, I was already kind of had racial issues. But now, you can probably imagine, I was stabbed by a black guy. Uh, anybody that had that color skin, uh, I had a problem with. And so I, 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 I searched my memory and searched my memory. And these guys used to always hang out, and they congregated down at the end of the parking lot. Well, I want you to know, Shannon, I got out of that hospital about, I don't know, I was probably in there three days after I woke up. They had me up and moving around, walking because you can. If they don't have you up and walking, you'll just, you'll you'll get all kinds of pleurisy and all kinds of issues in your lung. So they have to have you up upright and 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 walking around. Well, I vowed that I was going to get revenge, and so I walked down there with my staple still in my chest. I would when I, once I got out of the hospital, I was crazy, and I was I wanted revenge, and I would walk down there with no shirt on sporting my staples with the 357 Magnum stuck in the front of my pants. I'd walk down to that, in, that, that, that uh, parking lot and I would look at each one of those young men in their face just to see if I could recognize one of them. 
And I and I was very, very straight up. I said, if I recognize you guys all know why I'm here. And if I recognize any of you, if I see any any of you that were at my apartment, I'm gonna kill every one of you. And so that was my that was my thing. And so for about two weeks, every day for about two weeks, I walked down to that parking lot with a with with sporting my, my staples, no shirt on, with a 357 Magnum. I'd walk down there and they would like scatter. <laughs> they would scatter like like scared road cockroaches. Like you turn on a light and the cockroaches just scatter. As soon as they'd see me walking down there, they would disappear. And I'm and that's not and I'm I'm not saying that to 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 brag. I'm I'm giving all glory to God. Because if it wasn't for that, I would be a, I should be in prison or in jail or in prison or under the prison. Or something because I was I was dead set on getting revenge, and uh, I truly wanted to put whoever stabbed me in the ground and whoever was there that night that helped was part of that. I wanted to I wanted to make sure that all of them knew who did it. And by the grace of God, uh, that never happened. Our my 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 paths never crossed with them, and uh, and during that time, I uh, my sister I couldn't even drive myself around. So about three weeks into it, once I really was convicted. I walked down there one night and realized my promise that I met that I gave to the Lord that he reminded me, do you remember, you remember what you promised me? You didn't promise me that you were going to get out and get revenge. You promised me that you're going to run to me harder than you ever ran from me. And I began to just weep right there in that parking lot. And, uh, I felt the conviction of the Holy spirit right there. And, uh, and so, I basically gave up on that. I was like, you're right, God. I'm not, you know, you said the battle's yours and I relinquished that. And, uh, and so I was going to church at the same time, giving God the glory. And so it was really kind of an oxymoron. I was, I was really struggling with this bitterness, this anger, this revenge at the same time, knowing what I, what my promise was to the Lord. And, uh, and so I go three weeks later to get the staples removed from my chest. My sister, my oldest sister, drove me there. I go into the waiting room, and I'm sitting there, and there's this black guy, and he's eyeballing me. He's staring at me the whole time, would not take his eye off. So finally, I look over at my sister, and I said, Jenny, if this guy keeps eyeballing me, I'm going to try to take his head off right here in this parking, right in here in this waiting room. There was a couple chairs right next to where he was sitting at. I was already planning how I was going to kick his head off of his shoulders. I was going to jump up on this chair and kick his head like it was on a football tee because I, that's how, that's how bitter and how angry and how, how, how messed up I was. Even at that time, knowing, even knowing God saved my life, that's how deceived we can get sometimes in life. And, uh, self-deception is the worst kind of deception. You know, the enemies, he's a, he's out to steal, to kill and to destroy. And he's out, he's a, he's a deceiver. He's the Bible says he's the master of deception. We had to be so deceived, even in my own mind. That's the worst kind of deception is when we get self-deceived. And so I'm sitting there, and I was serious. And you know what? I think God knew how serious I was, and my sister knew how serious I was. I said, if he doesn't keep, if he doesn't quit staring at me, I'm going to hurt him right here in this in this in this waiting room. And she goes, Oh, Rod, please don't do that. Please don't do that. And I'm like, I'm just telling you. Finally, he would not quit staring at me. So I jump up out of my seat. I walk over and I'm ter- I'm kind of towering over him. And I said, man, why are you eyeballing me? I kind of put my finger right in his face. Why are you eyeballing me? I don't even know you, man. You don't know me. Why are you eyeballing me? And he said, with all, with all humility, Shannon, I mean, if he would have had one bit of an attitude, if he had had gave me any kind of an attitude whatsoever, it would have been on right then. And God knew it. He said, sir, I am so, so sorry. I don't mean to be disrespectful. But I was getting a heart, a, a heart valve replaced because Parkland Hospital is the best heart trauma unit in the nation. Because I was in, in Parkland, Parkland Hospital that night in the emergency room because the heart, my heart valve uh, failed and I was getting a, a procedure done. I was waiting in there and I watched them wheel you in and I heard them on the radio and you had flatlined. They lost you and lost your heartbeat in the, in the ambulance. And I literally watched them wheel you through and you were flatlined and I watched them hit you with the electrical paddles and I watched them bring you back to life and I watched them get a heartbeat. He goes, do you realize how much of a, how much of a miracle you are? He goes, I, he goes, I, I'm, I don't mean to be, I don't mean to be staring at you. I don't mean to be rude, but, but I, but I watched them bring you back to life. 
I looked over at my sister. I said, did you know any of this? Because at that time they hadn't even told me that my heart stopped and that I was a miracle and that all that, because they didn't want to put me through, I guess, the, the emotional part of all that. And so she goes, yeah, I you know, we heard, we heard some of this and it was just a miracle that the same guy that was sitting there to get, when I was getting my staples taken out, he was getting his staples taken out because he had open heart surgery at the same time. And, and, uh, and so that really changed my perspective, uh, really, of revenge, of, of even being racial. You know, God, God totally delivered me of, of all racial issues, uh, of, of, of the hate and the, and the revenge that I had at that time. I had to, I had to get totally delivered from the anger. Mm-hmm. So um, that's kind of the short story of, of me being stabbed through the heart and lung and, uh, and all that. And so... Uh, kind of fast forwarding a little bit. Um, God has used that story. I've been able to tell that story around the nation, especially here in the last couple of years. Um, uh, for many years, I've uh, been a, an evangelist. Uh, like I said, I, pa- I helped pastor Covenant Church for many years. I actually ended up pastoring one of the campuses in Denton and, uh, and then pastored a church for a while called Restoration Church, where I told the whole story of the restoration of how God's uh, brought me through total restoration uh, in my life, and um, and then went on, then then been kind of evangelizing and doing that uh, since then. Two years ago, our yes was uh, uh, a, a tent revival. God, our yes was God called me to get my old tent out and find a field and uh, get the fivefold ministry gifts prevalent and exemplified. Uh, he told me to get out of the way, to stay out of the way, and watch what I do. The last thing I wanted to do was 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 to start a church. I had no agenda to start a church, uh, but we did want to do an Awaken Texas revival. And that's really what it was all about. It was about waking we the people. I was like, where are we the people? Where is the remnant? And uh, we need to rally like-minded people together. So I'm not really trying to, to start a, and build a church, Shannon. I'm really trying to build an army of like-minded people to come together and stand for our constitutional rights, to stand for our rights as, as, as believers, as Christians, uh, but our constitutional rights, you know, as you know, the government right now is not even acknowledging our constitution, uh, you know, and they're, they're not, they're not, they're rights. They're not uh, privileges. Uh, they're actually God given rights. And so I think it's time for us as, as the body of Christ, as the ecclesia, whether it, we, we, you know, we're going, we're going across denominational lines. Uh, we're not, we don't look at denomination. We don't look at any of that kind of stuff. And we're just seeing full blown revival. We've been seeing it now for almost two years. Uh, but our, our, our big deal was to start Awaken Texas summer revival. Uh, this was last year and, uh, that has evolved into a full blown church now. Wow. So, I'm going to go ahead and just pull it up on screen just so they can see our y'all's website of our amazing church. Awesome. So this is the amazing church, which I mean, I don't think words can describe how good it is, but it is just filled with the Holy Spirit. And so right over here, if you can see it, this is a little bit of whenever we moved the chairs in, as a matter of fact. Yeah. And this is what our tent looks like. And so whenever we say it's a tent revival, it is a legit tent revival each it's Saturday true. night. And so I'm going to go ahead and bring up, if you are in Texas, right here is the address. And it's every Saturday night. It starts at 6 and there's not a time limit on it. That's right. And it will also be in the description for anyone who can't see that as well. That's right. We call it Saturday Night Live because uh, we're not we're not a church as usual. Uh, God didn't call us to do church. Called God called us to do revival. So He says, "You know what, Rod? You're going to be in a tent. Have revival till I come." So we're a tent church. We're a tent revival church. Uh, if someone's looking for a church that's normal, uh, that uh, just kind of goes through the motions and goes through, uh, a, you know, has their own agenda, that's then we're probably not for everybody. But we're truly a tent revival, our church, our services, uh, we're not a large church. Uh, there's times we have over a hundred. Um, when we launched with Greg Locke, we actually launched the last October 28th. 
with Pastor Greg Locke from from Tennessee, from Mount Juliet, Tennessee. He's a really good friend of mine, and he came and helped us do our church launch after a full blown summer of revival. Uh, we launched it uh, last October 28th, and we had uh, <laughs> it was in a drought. We were we were in a drought for months and it hadn't rained, but several days before our launch, it actually just had a downpour. And uh, but we had over 650 people, Shannon, show up for our first service uh, under the tent and uh, with Greg Locke and deliverance. Salvation hit the hit the tent. It was beautiful. Uh, we had beautiful worship for over an hour, hour and a half. And then salvation hit. Pastor Greg preached. Uh, deliverance hit. Mass deliverance hit our tent. You couldn't put another. It was a standing room only. You couldn't. Our tent only really only seats like 400 people. But we had over 650 people that showed up on our first service. So we really saw that as a foreshadowing of, of what was to come. And so we've seen we've seen hundreds of people in our tent. And then sometimes we only have you know 50 or 100 under the tent. But it's not about numbers. It's really about impact. And uh, we're real fancy. We baptize people in a horse trough. We have a six-foot horse trough that we've, ba- we've baptized hundreds of people in in the last two years. Uh, people are coming authentically. Uh, I say that uh, we're a church or a church alive is worth the drive. So we're, we're definitely not a church that's lukewarm. We're not a church that's lazy. We're not a church that's complacent or uh, about it. We're all about the fire and bringing the fire of the Holy Spirit preaching the gospel from Genesis to Revelation all the way through. We are not. We don't sugarcoat it. Uh, we don't do these little 20-minute, make you feel good, mamsy-pamsy, tickle-me-elmo uh, type, type, type messages. No, we're, gonna, we're not going to sugarcoat it. We're going to tell you the truth in love. And that's really what I believe that God's called me to do, Shannon, right now. So my mission is revival, 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 souls. Uh, and doing deliverance, God's really used us. Uh, he's, I've got a mantle. God's given me an anointing and a mantle in the area of, of uh, deliverance and inner healing. And we're seeing a lot of uh, regular physical healings. We're seeing uh, uh, physical manif- manifestations of healings happen. We're seeing a lot of salvation where people, uh, maybe people got hurt by church years ago when they were younger. They're coming under the tent. Uh, we're seeing folks that would never shadow the door of a church, but they'll come up under that tent and experience Jesus. So we're not asking people to come and, and experience church. We're really asking people to come and experience Jesus, a true relationship and encounter with Jesus. Because a lot of people know about church. A lot of people know about church and they know about Jesus, but they don't truly know Jesus. And so we want to we want to share the, the truth of the word of God, uh, all of it, every bit of it, with love, saturated with love. Uh, so we do, we take a stand against a lot of the, the elephants in the room and the, a lot of the issues in our society right now. We truly take a strong stand for life. I have a friend of mine, a really good friend of mine that's a part of the covering of our church. He, he, started, he started two movements. One is the church at Planned Parenthood, uh, and there's several of those. There's probably seven or eight of them uh, where churches have come together. They cross denominational lines and they come together together. And they worship God at the gates of hell, which is Planned Parenthood. And so that was the mandate that God gave Ken Peters was just go to Planned Parenthood, not to pick it, not to start trouble, not to start all that, but to worship God at the gates of hell. Well, with doing that, uh, other churches started coming and being a part. And everywhere where they've set up a, a, a Planned Parenthood or set up a church at Planned Parenthood, they've ended up shutting those Planned Parenthoods down and causing all kinds of stuff. So he's just trying to bring awareness to life. And to help and letting letting young girls know that they don't have to go to to do an abortion. There are other options, and we stand for life. And so, out of that, a huge movement was 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 developed called the Church at Planned Parenthood. And Planned Parenthood tried to sue Ken, and actually they did sue him for a million and a half dollars. But he's back. He's back right in their face. And just about everywhere where he opens a Planned Parenthood, they have to shut it down. So he's done that many. He actually started the movement called Patriot Church. So I've known Ken for over 30 years. We used to pastor together at Covenant Church years ago. And when we wanted to start talking about some political things, when we wanted to start talking about taking a stand for life, when we wanted to take a stand against uh, the the alphabet community and the alphabet community reading to our kids and wanting to sexualize our kids, 
when we wanted to truly start taking a, a strong stand from the pulpit from there, we got kind of the, uh, we kind of got the boot, um, if you will, um, because a lot of these woke churches don't want to talk about um, these things that really need to be talked about. Um, so, so, so basically that's what led me to start uh, Jesus Encounters Patriot Church is, was that we need to tell the truth in love. We need to tell it all the truth, nothing but the truth, and not just, uh, you know, a lot of these pastors nowadays are all about the big screens, the fog machines, and the skinny jeans, right? That's what they're about. <laughs> I tease about that a lot, but they're about the fog machines, the skinny jeans, and the big screens, and you almost feel like you're in a nightclub. You know, we don't need to go to church to, to, be, to be like the world. The church has become too, too much like the world. And uh, the Bible says to be in the world, but not of the world. We don't need to go to church to be entertained. So what we do under the tent is we're not there to entertain people. We're there to, to experience an encounter with, with Jesus and see his power move and see it be manifest. And we're seeing, you've seen it with your own eyes. You've seen people come under that tent and be totally delivered of uh, drug addiction, of sexual immorality, of perversion, of lust, of porn, of drug abuse. I mean, you name it, eating, overeating, it's every hang up or issue. It's not just drugs and alcohol, but, oh, yeah. uh, but you know, Christians, uh, Christians can have, uh, can be oppressed by demons as well. And if we, uh, and so we teach that if you're a Christian and you've checked that box once, maybe, and you go to church, maybe on Sundays occasionally, if you've left your, your life and doors open to sin, then you can still have repetitive cycles of sin and demonic oppression come into your life. And so we try to help people get, get free, 100% free. Yeah. So, and right now, this is the most, I mean, right now, I can't even find the words for it, but we have to start spreading God's word because, I mean, as you and I, we believe that we're living in the end times and it's not just us. I mean, there's so many things around, like it, all the Jewish people in America, they've started fleeing back to Israel well, in the Bible, don't ask me which verse, but you can look it up. In the Bible, in the end times, they're fleeing back to their own country. I don't, mm -hmm. I personally don't think that that's a coincidence. Just like mm -hmm. how whenever they add Ukraine to the UN, if they do, that's 13. Well, how many little horns are there? 13. 13. That's right. So right. we got to start spreading the word, is all I can say. Absolutely. And we got to spread the, the, all the, the whole news, not just the, the, the parts that we like about the Bible. And that's what I've seen through a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of uh, religions, a lot of different denominations. They want to pick and choose what they want to believe of the word, you know, and whether it's an Old Testament belief or an Old Testament scripture or a New Testament scripture. You know, it's it's the whole word. It's all of it. We have to believe it all. We, we either have to believe it's all true or it's all a lie. And we know, we know the Bible's all the way true. And so I'm seeing a lot of, a lot of pastors nowadays, they're really good. They're gifted uh, from being able to preach a sermon and, put, and say things real well, right? But it's really, it's not about how well we, how, how gifted we are and how good of a preacher we are. There's a lot of preachers I'm seeing nowadays, they don't even bring a Bible to the pulpit. They won't even read scripture. They're wanting to talk about self-help and using it like a, like like a uh, like a like a like basically like yeah like self-help and using their theories, using their stories, uh, you know all that kind of stuff to back up what they're trying to preach. And they need to basically just preach the word of God. I believe your generation is hungry for the true word of God to be preached and demonstrated. And so. That's why we're doing what we're doing. We have a start time. We start at 6 a 6 p.m., but uh, our agenda is Jesus. We don't have, we're not like a box church where we have a few songs written down and we have you're, you're going to sing for 15 or 20 minutes and then you're going to take an offering and then you're going to have a 20 minute message and we're going to get you in and out of there in an hour. That's not what we're doing there. If you if you want to have revival, you cannot put time constraints on the Holy Spirit. We have to truly go after Him and uh in spirited and truth and so uh that's what we're that's what we're experiencing we're just experiencing a true revival move of god um more so than just church as usual and that's really how we got hooked in shannon to even starting a church because 
Well, I'll tell you something. It's kind of funny. I, the first thing about it, after we had like two services under the tent, people were saying, please don't tell me you're going to end this this summer. Please tell me this is going to be a church. And I'm like, no, I didn't. I don't want to start a church. I, doing a church is like herding cats. I don't want to get involved in all the bureaucracy and then arguing about the bureaucracy and arguing about the color of the paint or any, all that drama that a lot of churches have. I said, no, no, no. I, I'm, I'm, God said for me to do a summer revival. So I don't want to get ahead of God. And so when people started coming and they started getting full deliverance, then that's what hooked me is because then they needed discipleship. So that's what we're trying to do now is we're seeing people come and we've become a, a church that, that people know they can come and they can experience Jesus. They can rededicate their life. They can get totally born again. They can get baptized spontaneously. They can get delivered and set free of whatever it is that they're looking for. But now it's time to be for discipleship. It's not, we don't just come get people delivered and then leave them. We get them delivered so they can actually get plugged into their purpose. And so now they're, they're no longer in bondage. Now they can actually fulfill the purpose that God created them to be, you know, why they're on this planet in the first place, but because now they're free. And so that's how we kind of got hooked into the church because now we have to disciple these people that are getting set free. So here we are. And uh, we are, we just celebrated a year this last uh, Pentecost set, uh, weekend. It was May 27th, and that's when we kicked off the Remnant Revolution. Was that was our actual one year anniversary? And so, uh, God has had us lately on Mission America with the Remnant Revolution tour, where God has opened up doors for us to take revival, not just here in Texas, but they're seeing they're seeing it on 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 our Facebook every weekend. They're seeing it on our YouTube. And I'm getting invitations every week, Shannon, to come and bring revival to different states around the nation right now. So uh, I just got back from the Northwest, the Pacific Northwest, went up to the Oregon Grass Pass area. Uh, a few months ago, I went to New York. We brought deliverance to New York. It happened beautifully uh, in several different places. I was in New York for three or four days doing revival, just got out of Oregon, back from Oregon. And those are parts of our nation right now that are so dark and such a need for, for deliverance. Uh, it's unbelievable. I can't, I couldn't believe how many people are showing up because I'm a nobody. I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody and tell them my story. And uh, God's given me a gift as I humble myself, he's given me a gift and anointed me to help people get free. And so that, that gift he's, I, I've asked the Lord, I've, Okay, God, if you'll open the door, I'll step through the doors. And so he's been opening doors just about every week for me to go different places and preach. And we're seeing revival everywhere we go around the nation. So it's pretty awesome. Yeah. So I guess what I'm trying to say is revival follows you everywhere. If you search Jesus Encounters Church and look under videos just on your regular search engine, I noticed revival pretty much just follows your family. And in a local movie theater, you had an outbreak. I had no clue about that. So, how does that happen? Yeah. Does it just come out, or I don't know. I, I guess it's you just. Uh, I'll cry talking about it because I feel the Holy Spirit on it. But. Uh, uh, I think when you've gone through and you've needed as much help as much mercy, as much grace as I've had needed in my life and where we're at as a nation. Uh, it's just a huge need. Uh, we were, what Shannon's talking about is uh, we were a part of the come out in Jesus name uh, movie that came out to the local theaters. It came out um, last year. Um, it came out for a two night premiere and then it, it did so well that they opened it up again for like a couple weeks. But uh, that's where we actually met Robert and Jamie, which are some mutual friends of ours. Shannon is uh, we with a year and a half. I'll back. I'll kind of kind of uh, push rewind about a year and a half ago. We were watching a uh, Brighty on TV, Mike Adams show that had Robert and Jamie AG of with banners for freedom on it. And my wife said, babe, you need to come listen to this testimony. They have a testimony that's very similar to ours. They're construction. They're in construction and God's led them to do this ministry. And, That was right when God was calling us to do the tent and to get the old tent out and start revival. And uh, they were telling their story. 
And I just kind of popped off and said, wow, honey, they're in Bonham. They're only like 20 or 30 minutes from us. God's going to God's gonna connect us with that couple. And then fast forward a year and a half. We were actually in Mount Juliet, and we didn't know that this was going to turn out to be a movie, but it ended up being a documentary movie, a docu-movie called Come Out in Jesus' Name, and it was all about deliverance. So we were at the Global Vision Bible Church uh, first annual conference, deliverance conference, uh, and I want you to know mass deliverance broke out. Over 6,000 people showed up in a tent that seats about 3,500 or 4,000. Uh, Pastor Greg Locke had no idea. He did a free he did a free conference, had no idea how many thousands of people would show up. But people came from all over the world, not just I met people from India. I met people from Uganda, Africa, Pakistan. Uh, I, I met them from from Mexico. I mean, there was people from all over the world and all over the nation. Met people from Alaska were there, people from Pennsylvania, ca uh, California. I mean, Florida. There was campers. There was RVs. That This place was packed. And mass deliverance broke out for four days, and they men ended up making a movie out of it. That's when I was really launched in to deliverance ministry. It was already happening under the tent, and that's why I went to the to the conference in the first place because it started happening organically under the tent. And I wanted to learn more. Me and my wife knew uh, quite a bit about deliverance, and we had gone through deliverance ourselves personally and privately. Went through some inner healing and some deliverance. So I wasn't afraid of it, and uh, I, had, I had done some of it in my ministry. Uh, it was happening organically already under our tent when they made this available and said, "Hey, come! We're going to do this this uh, this uh, conference. It's going to be free. Get here." That's what Greg was telling everybody. We uh, we knew that we would be in, that being disobedient if we didn't go. So we actually took three couple, two couples, two other couples from our church that wanted to learn more about deliverance because, like I said, it was already happening under the tent. It started breaking out. And so uh, we just needed to learn more about it, get some more experience. So two other couples went with us. We went down there for four days. And what we thought, it was unbelievable. I was seeing people by the thousands worshiping God, full-blown Christians that were manifesting demons by the thousands, not just a few. Uh, so I saw it with my own, with my own eyes. Full-blown Christians that loved Jesus, that had left open doors to sin, that were in bondage to drugs and alcohol and porn and you name it. And they were manifesting by the thousands, Shannon, all over this tent. Well, they captured all that on video and made a movie out of it called Come Out in Jesus' Name. And that's and so on the movie premiere, uh, it, we, 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 uh, we bought two theaters out, one in Denton and one in Sherman. We were there, and uh, we looked up, and I had somebody with a cowboy hat filming me, Deliverance, broke out in a live theater all over the theater. People were manifesting all over the theater. It was only me and my wife and a couple other people that even knew how to do deliverance in the Sherman theater. And so we were in there for over two, two and a half hours doing deliverance in a public theater. And I, I say this all the time, the church kicked the Holy spirit out and kicked deliverance out. And, and basically uh, <laughs> he was found at the public theater in Sherman, Texas, and not just in Sherman. It happened on the same night in 2,300 theaters across the nation, okay? The church kicked deliverance out, kicked the Holy Spirit out, and he had to show up in a public theater. And that's what happened in 2,300 theaters across the nation. Uh, I look up, and Robert Agee is actually videoing me while I'm doing a deliverance on a, a young lady that was a witch. She screamed this huge scream. Everybody, even the ones that were in there manifesting, uh, they stopped to look at who was screaming. Everybody in there was looking. And so I look over my shoulder and Robert Agee, I'm usually the guy wearing a cowboy hat. Well, that night I'd just come from work and I had a ball cap on, like kind of like you have on. And and I look over my shoulder and I see this guy in a cowboy hat filming me. Well, I didn't think anything about it. I'm I'm casting out demons, right? So I keep do I keep at it. Within a couple minutes, Robert Agee is is down there helping me. He's praying in his prayer language. He put his phone away and he's helping me cast out demons. Well, little did I know, on the other side of the theater. Uh, Jamie, his wife, was helping Suzanne, my wife, with deliverance for about two hours. Well, they kicked us out of the theater. It's dark in there, so we didn't have a chance to stop and meet one another. Was, Hi, I'm Rod. I'm Robert. None of that happened. We got up there in the main foyer, and the lights are on, and I'm talking to a little lady that I helped with some deliverance, and my wife shouts out, said, Honey, it's that couple. 
It's that couple I saw on Brighton. I'm going, what are you talking about? What couple? She goes, you know, the, the couple we saw on Brighton with Banners for Freedom. And sure enough, that was them. It was Robert and Jamie a year and a half later in the public theater. So, yes, to answer your question, Revival has been following us because I really believe that's our mandate. It's really our mandate. It's not just Suzanne and I's mandate. But I believe that God calls people for such a time as this. And God has called Suzanne and I not for church as usual, but to, for, but for full-blown revival. And so, yes, uh, the Bible says in Mark 16, these signs shall follow those who believe. It says, you shall cast out demons in my name. Then it says, you shall speak in other tongues. It doesn't say you might. It says, these signs shall follow those who believe. You put your name right there. Are you a believer? So if you're a believer, you can, you should, we should be casting out demons. Then we should be, ca- then we should be speaking in other tongues. Doesn't say we might, says that we shall. So I really believe in this time and season, God has put a mantle on me and my wife for revival. So uh, I believe it's a special anointing that he's, that he's given me. He's given me a fire that shut up in my bones. Uh, so I have a lot of energy. I have a lot of fire. I like to, and I, I like to come and bring that energy, bring my story and, and give all God all the glory for it because I, I'm, a, I'm a dead man walking. I really shouldn't be able to tell my story. I shouldn't be able to have children and grandchildren and have beautiful friends like you and have a beautiful church. I, I really should be either in jail or dead. Uh, so I know that my job is to pull as many people out of the ditch uh, to get as many souls saved as I can uh, before Jesus comes back, before he returns. So I know that's my job. My call and my gifting is souls. Uh, and so now with our church growing like it is, now it's time we're going to be starting and launching a Wednesday night service pretty soon so we can start a discipleship program. Uh, our discipleship program is going to look a lot different than than just a regular one at church that you've seen at any other church. We're going to be talking about prepping. Uh, we're not uh, we're, we're, we're going to be prepared. We're going to prepare the body of Christ. We're not scared. We're going to be prepared uh, because there's a lot of things coming down the pike. Uh I'm so proud of you, Shannon, and what you're doing with being with being the young patriot, having this having this channel because it's it's your generation that's going to carry us over the finish line. It's your generation that's going to we're going to pass this baton to, but it's your generation that we must empower, that we must model. You must model to see we got to model and exemplify what revival looks like and what the power of God looks like demonstrated, and so. Uh, so that's really what I feel like God's called me to do. And I really believe that because I'm just being obedient, it's called radical obedience. I believe that uh, the Bible says that obedience is better than sacrifice. And so delayed obedience is still disobedience. So the only credit I can take for the revival that's happening under our tent in Collinsville, the only credit I can take for a revival that's happening all across the nation when God leads me to a place all I can say, it comes out of my humility because I'm nothing special. But I, I, but what I can tell you that, that uh, the Holy Spirit that lives within me, that lives within you, is a roaring lion. And when we, when we submit ourselves in humility and we live a lifestyle of humility, then God will use us. And that same power that rose him from the dead, that, that, that defeated death, burial, and the grave, that same power lives within me and you. And as I submit myself in humility, if I think it's about me, I have no power. There's nobody, there's not one, there's even these guys out here that are self-proclaimed demon slayers. There's no demon slayer but Jesus Christ. That's the only demon slayer there is. I can't deliver anybody out of a wet paper bag. But as I, as I submit myself, and as you submit yourself, as we submit ourselves in a lifestyle and take a posture of humility, and let that Holy Spirit work through us. There's not one demon. There's not one sickness. There's not one disease that's safe under that tent or in any building that God has us in because it's him. He's the deliverer. He's the one that saves us. He's the one that heals us. He's the one that delivers us. And so it comes out of the worship. He inhabits the praises of his people. So what recipe do I have? It's his recipe. He said, worship me in spirit and truth. He inhabits the praises of his people. So all I'm doing, Shannon, is I've, he's given me the recipe for revival. And all I'm trying to do is stay true to his recipe. 
Mm. It's like when you get a good family recipe on a cake. You know, if I leave something out, it ain't going to taste like it, like that family recipe, right? Well, right. His, re his recipe for revival is the five-fold ministry gifts. That's, what, that's the key, the five-fold ministry gifts, having apostles, having which is, which is the fivefold is apostles, it's prophets, it's preachers, it's teachers, and pastors. That's the fivefold. And we have the fivefold happening under that tent every service, whether I'm there or whether I'm not. Because, yeah. because the, the, uh, you've been there when I'm there, and you see the fire fall, and you've been there when I'm not there. The fire still fall. We don't miss a beat. We rock on because it's not built around my personality. It's built around the fivefold ministry gifts. And so we just make sure that if I'm not there to preach, that we've got an anointed preacher that has a fitted word that's going to be in that that's going to be in that pulpit. Uh, and sometimes it might be a prophet. Sometimes it might be a teacher. Sometimes it might be a preacher. Uh, but God's called our ministry, Jesus Encounters, that you're a big part of, uh, to revival, not church as usual. It's it's revival. It's time in this day and time. These end times that we live in. We must live a lifestyle of revival. It has to be a lifestyle. It can't yeah. just be something. It can't just be something that we do every now and then. It truly has to be a lifestyle. Yeah, especially whenever we're living in the end times. That's right. So and I tell people a lot too that we, in order to live a lifestyle of revival, we have to live a lifestyle of repentance. We got to be quick and be good at repenting because we're all flesh. We have. We, we, we're, you know, we're flesh and bone. We're born into a sin nature. So it's not if we're ever going to sin again. It's it, we're going to sin, but we need to be quick. We need to go. There's only one that was that was sinless. Right. And that was Jesus Christ. But we're so but if we have him living in our life and we have him and we're really trying to, to be a Jesus follower. There's so many people that raise their hands. Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian, but they don't change the way they live. You know, they're not they're not changing the way they live. If you don't change your direction and repent and change. That's what repentance is. Repentance is just not crying a few tears saying, Oh, I'm sorry. That's a great start, but that's not truly repentance. Repentance is not just crying from your eyes. It's crying from your heart and it's being willing to pivot and change direction to go a different direction, to quit watching those things that you know, you shouldn't be watching to quit saying the things that you, that you said, quit smoking. weed. quit doing the things. quit doing the things that we know are holding us back. You know, and so that's what a lot of people do. They want the benefits of church. They want the benefits of being delivered or of being saved, of being baptized, all that. Then they want to go right back to living a lifestyle that's a sinful lifestyle. And that's not true repentance. So before we go, would you give me the honor of praying over my audience for me? Absolutely. Absolutely. And we want to invite you. If you guys don't have a church to go to, uh, we want to invite you out to 9517 U.S. Highway 377. That's in Collinsville, Texas. We say a church alive is worth the drive. You may be watching uh, here in Texas. You may be you may live two or three hours away. Let me just tell you, it's worth the drive to come. Um, you can watch us if you're too far away. You can log in and watch us on our website. We've uh, we've got Jesus Encounters Patriot Church up here on the screen, uh, or you can go to our website at Jesus Dash Encounters. Dot org. We also have a YouTube called Jesus Encounters Patriot Church that you can log on and follow uh, and uh, become a part of our online community because we interact with our online community. We chat, we pray, we do all that. You can be a part of watching live revival every weekend. But yes, I would love to pray. Let's do that now. Father God, we just thank you for this day. And Father God, I just thank you for Shannon Miles. I thank you for the young Patriot. I thank you, Father, for this audience. I thank you for each and every person that's viewing or uh, maybe you'll be watching the rebroadcast of this today. I want you to know that Jesus loves you. He cares about every intricate detail of your life. And he wants a relationship with you. It's not about religion. It's about relationship with the Father. So, Father, we just thank you for each and every person listening. We ask you, Lord, that they would hunger and thirst for your for more knowledge of you, to get into your word, to get into your presence, and to truly seek your face, Father. And we just ask you, Lord, that uh, for anybody that's listening, if they have any need, whether it's a financial need, a health need, maybe uh, maybe they're struggling. Maybe they're struggling with who they are. 
of their own, even their own identity, who they are uh, in you, who they, what they're even supposed to do in life, why they're here. And Father, you're the one that answers all those questions for us. And so, Father, we just thank you for each and every person that's listening. I ask you, Lord, Father, for blessing on their life. We ask you, Lord, to, to bless them from the north, the south, the east, the west, everyone that's listening. We ask you for your favor. And there's no coincidence in your kingdom. There's no coincidence that whoever's listening to this broadcast is listening today. Uh, the word coincidence is not even in the Bible. The closest word is favor. So, Father, we just receive your favor today. We receive your love. We receive your mercy. Most of all, we receive your grace. And Father, we just ask you to baptize us with a new hunger and thirst and a new fire to experience your presence and experience truly who you are. Not church. We know about church. We want to know about you, Jesus. So Father, I just pray for uncommon encounters with Jesus, with the listeners and anybody that's here watching. If you need any special prayer, preach, please reach out to Shannon or myself. We would love to, to pray with you. That's what we live for, uh, is to pray with you and agree with you. Uh, we would love to see you under the tent and hug your neck. So God bless you. Is a, Again, it's been a pleasure and an honor, Shannon, to be able to be here on your show with you today. And uh, was there any other questions or anything that you wanted to ask me? Are we um, good? I think we're good for now, but if you'll stay on so I can work a little bit stuff after the stream. So. All right. Well, thank you for coming on. It's been an honor. And thank you, the viewer, for watching. You are amazing. God bless you. Have a great rest of your day. And Jesus loves you. Shannon Miles, signing out.